Now we have amongst us Mr. Arif Nariman, a senior advocate in Supreme Court, and son of legal luminary Mr. F. S. Nariman. He is worthy son of worthy father. He has been kind enough to accept our request to be here. I request Mr. Nariman to please come and address us on the topic. Mr. Nariman. Thank you very much. Chief Justice Lahoti, uh, dignitaries on the dais, ladies and gentlemen, to have to inflict my voice upon three honorable Supreme Court judges on a Saturday morning is, I think, a little more than what they bargained for. But I promise this will not be a court performance. I intend to stick to the time allotted to me. You have heard many great names bandied about today. And two of them I recall with a special affection, that of Sir Jamshedji Kanga and Mr. H.M. Sirivai. They both happened to be Parsi priests first, before they were lawyers. A qualification which somehow I, in my own humble way, also fulfill. Now, to become a Parsi priest, one has to undergo an extremely rigorous training at the age, say, between 10 and 12. One has to con by rote some three and a half hours of prayers, which one then has to spill out on the 28th day of incarceration in a fire temple. You have to, pay, you have to pray five, five times a day and generally live a life of seclusion even before you have attained majority. But the one thing that sticks out in my memory at least, as part and parcel of that extremely rigorous training, is the tremendous emphasis of all the priests on two of our fundamental prayers. And the first one is simple and beautiful. I'll say it in Avestan first and translate it for you. Ashem bahu vaishtam asti ushta asti ushta ammai hyadashai vaishtai ashem. People, uh, some of you who know Rigvedic Sanskrit will probably recognize the meaning because it's said in the exact sister language. And the simple beauty of this prayer is such that all it does is to link truth with happiness. It says Asha, which is the same as the Vedic, Rigvedic Ritta, is good. Indeed, it is the best. There's nothing higher than this. It alone is happiness, and it grants happiness to those who wish to practice Asha for the sake of Asha itself, doing truth for its own good. The other extremely beautiful prayer, which is again another fundamental Zoroastrian prayer, is divided naturally into three parts. The first part deals with persons who are in power, and all that glitters which is gold, and contrasts it with the simple man who is spiritual, and says, don't ever forget, all these people are ephemeral, spirituality alone lasts. This is the first part. The second part is that one must do good deeds in this life out of love for Almighty God, otherwise one is not truly spiritual. And the third part is that one must remember those who are meeker and weaker than oneself, and one must help them when in need. Now, these were the values which were instilled in me as a boy of 12. We now move on until one has finished the BCom examination, and one enters the portals of a law college. What are one of the first few things that are taught there? And these again are impressions which have lasted for the rest of my life. The very first thing you are taught in contract law is that an ordinary promise without consideration is not a contract at all. What are you taught in criminal law? That a person who is reasonably guilty of the offense will be let off 
if all that he does is create some sort of doubt in the mind of the judge. Now, contrast these two experiences, which I myself have gone through, and put spirituality on the one hand and law on the other. Is there any meeting ground at all? And most importantly, is our constitution silent? Now, fortunately for us, our constitution contains certain fundamental values, which values you will find in its preamble. Apart from stating that we are a sovereign democratic republic, which is socialistic and secular in nature, four very important values are outlined, and three of them are of a vintage, which is at least 200 years old, liberté, égalité, fraternité, the very words used in the French Revolution, revolutionary words. But apart from these three terms, you also have the expression justice. Now, when we speak, therefore, of justice, liberty, equality, we are talking fundamentally of citizens' rights against an almighty and all-powerful government. It is the fourth value which is of some relevance in today's talk. And that value is the value of fraternity, brotherhood. Brotherhood somehow eluded us in the Constitution for a couple of years until by the 42nd Amendment, a separate chapter was laid down speaking of citizens' duties to one another as opposed to citizens' rights as against a state. And one of those duties expressly states that it is very important that we mold ourselves into a common brotherhood which somehow transcends religious and other barriers. You also have one other core principle in our constitution, which though 50 years have passed, unfortunately doesn't really seem to have been put into practice, and which is that there ought to be a free and compulsory education of all children at least until the age of 14. And mind you, the founding fathers laid down about 10 years in order to achieve this. We are nowhere near achieving it. We are only mounting platitudes. Now, it is my dream which I wish to share with you today that when we impart our constitutional values to these children, we should, in order to transcend at least religious barriers first, be able first to impart and understand other people's religion and religious background. And if possible, try and discover some common link or some commonality between them. And let me tell you, being a student of comparative religion, I have tried very hard to do just that and think that I have hit upon something which I want to share with you. We all, of course, begin with the great Rig Veda. Now, in the tenth mandala, of which most of you must be familiar, we have various notions of divinity which keep cropping up. In chapter 72, for example, Brahmanaspati is spoken of who, like a blacksmith with his bellows, puts breath into the gods and then into humans. In chapter 81, you have the notion of an architect of the universe, Vishwakarma, with a hammer actually fashioning the universe. In chapter 90, you have the famous Purush Shukta, where you have cosmic man, who through sacrifice manages ultimately to send three quarters of himself into the heavens and one fourth to us, from which all of us seem to have come. You have in chapter 121, Hiranya Garba, the cosmic egg, from which all of us have come. And above all, in chapter 129, you suddenly hit upon the idea of a Swayambhu, of something which has existed when nothing existed before it, and all by itself. Divinity, the Godhead, finally is hit upon in this all-important chapter. 
our own prophet, Zarathustra, described himself as a Rig Vedic Hotar, a fire priest, an Agnihotri, and received a vision from an almighty God who declared himself for the first time, called himself Mazda, which means great creator, is the creator of everything, and in that revelation laid down to a Rig Vedic seer, God alone knows how many thousand years ago, all the fundaments of many modern religions, heaven, hell, an individual judgment of the soul at death, a final judgment day, and then a resurrection into which all of us will be born into eternal life. Now, each of these ideas were not there in Judaism as originally practiced. But it is because King Cyrus, 2,500 years ago, conquered Babylon and set the Jews free that Palestine ultimately accepted each one of these ideas. And through the Jews, these ideas crept into Christianity and then into Islam. We therefore have, believe it or not, a direct link between a Rigvedic seer and all the modern other religions, you know, with, with which whom we all, we all live side by side. Come to the ethical part as well. In ethics, of course, there is much more closeness in all the great religions. Come to the ancient Jain religion, for example, of which I am a great admirer. The Jains were perhaps the first on earth to tell us about Ahimsa. Ahimsa no matter how hard and how long the road to victory may be. Because ahimsa is a principle to be practiced even in dire circumstances, according to them. Non-violence at all times. Another fantastic theory that they preached long, long ago, the theory of anekantvad, which is the many, side of, or the many sides of truth. Many people experience truth in their own ways. Each one of them may be right, and perhaps in the ultimate sense, each one of them may be wrong, which is that famous story about the elephant and the seven wise men in a dark room, each of whom feels a certain part of the elephant and describes it as the elephant. When the light is put on, all of them realize they are wrong, and they actually see the elephant. So it takes enlightenment ultimately to see the elephant. So whether it be this in, among the giants, whether it be the emphasis on truth in my religion, whether it be the great emphasis in the Gita on not ever escaping from action, but renouncing the fruits of action, whether it be the great Sermon on the Mount uttered by Jesus, blessed, for example, are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Or whether, ultimately, it is the fundamental ethical part of each one of these faiths. What is important to impart, therefore, to our children, is the fact that there is a commonality both metaphysically and ethically. And the commonality very simply expressed is belief in a divine being and the fact that your actions are bound to reap. Ultimately, ultimately they are bound to either recall upon you, recoil upon you, or give you a place in heaven or give you a good place in, in a reincarnated earth. But what is important is that if these values are imparted to children who happen to be up to the tender age of 18, what will happen is you will build up not only a law-abiding citizenry first, you will also have lawyers who come out of that, that law-abiding citizenry who will be compassionate by nature and who will be conciliators instead of fighters. And then above all, you will also have judges who will judge not merely according to law, but be able to do what is very, very difficult 
individual justice in each case. It is with this vision that I end, and thank you very, very much. Thank you for enlightening us and reminding us to our duties towards spirituality.